My name, my friends, is Josh Long. I work on the Spring team. I'm a Spring uh, developer advocate. I'm a Kotlin Google developer expert, a Java champion, and most importantly, I'm at your service as always. So should you have questions, comments, feedback, whatever, uh, don't hesitate to find me on the internet. Uh, and I am nothing if not uh, on the internet. You know, I'm a very online kind of person for better or for worse. Uh, and so I've got a blog. I just updated that. Uh, that's that's fun. I have a book. I'm, I'm second edition or no, it's actually like the 1.1 edition, whatever, 1.1 one ish edition um and uh the code that we're going to look at here today is typically you know there's a actually the code is elsewhere just look for uh, kubernetes native java Josh, instead yeah sorry for interrupting you maybe if you uh, uh push the lid a little bit up so we can see your whole face on the camera oh, no. yeah How's that's that? perfect thank you ah, sorry for good. interrupting you no problem um so anyway uh codes online and I do a YouTube series called Spring Tips. Every Wednesday, there's a new video. This week, I did a, a video looking at multi-tenant JDBC there. I have a podcast every Thursday. Uh, that was yesterday. Uh, and uh, that one, I uh, had a um, an amazing uh, event streaming engineer from, uh, from Confluent to talk about Apache Kafka design patterns. Um, and uh, what else? I got... I got Twitch, I got Twitter, LinkedIn, you know, I'm just, I'm there. I'm there, my friends. I'm happy to answer questions, happy to engage, happy to have a conversation uh, because this stuff is super exciting to me. It's very important to me to help people build better software and get it into production. And these days, more often than not, for better or for worse, for YAML or for JSON, production is Kubernetes, right? And I like Kubernetes because, I mean, frankly, it's just a big object graph, right? Like it, it feels kind of familiar, you know, if you've ever used Spring, you're kind of like, oh, okay, I get it. You've got objects that depend on each other. And they, you're making explicit those dependencies through uh, references. Cool, okay, I, I can hang. It's a little verbose, uh, the YAML, you know, I'm not a big YAML fan, uh, but hey, you know, it's a thing. So anyway, production, super interesting, right? There's an interesting opportunity here uh, because now, Production can keep up with us. You know what I'm saying? We, we as developers, we're so used to, uh, to just being able to deliver software very quickly. That's you know we've spent the last 25 plus odd years, uh, sort of looking at different um, approaches, different disciplines to allow us to build better software and get it out there more quickly. And uh, and you know it's worked. I think. I think if you looked at the average velocity of your average de developer uh, today, uh, she or he is going to be markedly more productive than she or he would have been, say, that's 20 years ago, right? That productivity, however, is tempered by the speed at which the rest of the organization can move, right? The, the slower the rest of the organization, the less valuable your velocity is. So what we want is a holistic approach to delivering software at speed. Um, and, you know, it's, we're, we're seeing that. It's, we're seeing organizations as a whole start to be more agile and, and all that. Uh, and I think Kubernetes is kind of one of those things where it, it's an on-ramp for the whole organization to get on board because it gives you the ability to describe workloads uh, at any level of granularity that you like, whether it's a uh, big picture, like I'm just going to deploy all these things, these thousands and thousands of lines of YAML, or if it's like at the, at the, at the small picture, I want to just focus on this one little thing. Uh, every part of the organization can latch onto something, they can use Kubernetes to get into production and they can do so in a quick way. And very similar to uh, a lot of things that have come before it, obviously, I think we've all sort of had a, a reckoning, a discussion around where the, uh, what, what the approach people should take for building applications on Kubernetes is because uh, obviously, you know, th there's no one size fits all, right? And that's one of the magic things about Kubernetes is that you can just use the thing that you care about and, and work with that but it's, it's a big open object graph. It's an API server, basically. And so if you want to do something in a more concise way, great, just build an abstraction on top of it. And so many people have done that. So many people have built things on top of Kubernetes to simplify the work of getting things onto Kubernetes. And so as a result, you know, you can start with like raw Kubernetes and that's fine for some use cases. But if you want the more abstract platform as a service-like experience, that's fine as well. One thing that I noticed uh, 10 years ago is people start to build applications in their cloud uh, or their technology of choice. And that becomes a, uh, uh, you know, 
a, a uh, gravity well, right? In fact, uh, Dave McCory even talked about that. He talked about the idea of a uh, of data gravity. You you add you add data to something like Salesforce. Salesforce becomes valuable because it has all the data, and so you start to build these applications, these ancillary applications that connect to Salesforce, and then that in turn pulls in more data. So now you've got this thing that's pulling in all the data in your organization, and it becomes increasingly hard to to pull it out, right? The same is happening now with the cloud. If you can make it so that you can accommodate all sorts of different workloads, then you have the possibility of pulling in all the apps, no matter what the granularity, no matter what the level of, of, of abstraction. And Kubernetes, I think, has the, is the first thing to really have a good shot at doing that. I, I've always been a champion of more concise, more productive, more sort of developer-focused platform as a service technologies. And I still love those things. But I'm, I'm loving the possibilities that Kubernetes offers us because it allows me uh, to work at that high level if I want. I can uh, use higher level technologies like Knative that sits on top of Kubernetes. Or if, if you just have a one and done kind of workload and you want to get it deployed, you can do that as well, right? I love that possibility. And it used to be that if you were using a platform as a service, a higher level thing, um, you know, 80% of your workloads work just fine in that higher level thing, that higher order abstraction. The problem is that when you have some use case that doesn't fit into that mold, well, then you have to go down and you have to go down into the uh, the platform. And that's a completely different world. You know, it's a completely different level of, of, of abstraction, a completely different technology set. And so it's very tempting. Once you get there, you're like, okay, well, I guess I'm down here in the weeds. I need to start using, you know, Terraform or, or uh, CloudFormation or something like that, right? That's my new world. Uh, it doesn't look as simple and concise as it used to when I was up at the high level uh, platform as a service, it's very tempting to say, okay, well, I've invested enough to figure out how to get a simple web app with a URL and load balancing up and running. Uh, why not just turn all of my higher order stuff into this new lower level stuff? And so you end up trying to pull down this higher order stuff into the low level pit of, uh, uh, of your platform. And then of course the problem is that all that stuff ends up falling down on top of you, right? It's not good. So what we want is to have one kind of stuff, one platform for both the low level stuff where you just want, you know, CPU and a hard disk and you really need to have granular controls over this and that, uh, or your higher order sort of online transactional web apps for which we have uh, many a uh, choice uh, for, for deployment. So Kubernetes is great in that respect, um, but we still have to write software that's value, that works well there. Okay, so that's what we're gonna talk about today, my friends. We're gonna talk about, Different things you can do to build software using Spring, of course, because I'm a, I love Spring. I think it's a, it's a neat thing. And I'm not just talking about the season, although it is springtime. Did you see that? Uh, March 20th, five days ago, that was the, uh, the, you know, now whether you're talking about astrologically or meteorologically, it's, been, it's now spring officially. And I love that. It makes me very happy. Spring is longer days, more blue skies, beautiful weather. I mean, here in the Northern Hemisphere, obviously for people in the Southern Hemisphere, it's a very sad time indeed. But anyway, um, I love spring. I love, I love that possibility. So let's talk about that. Let's build some software uh, that takes advantage of all these uh, opportunities that, that, um, that uh, Kubernetes gives us, okay? So I'm gonna go here. I'm gonna go to my second favorite place on the internet. Obviously, obviously, um, my first favorite place on the internet is production. I love production. You should love production. You should go as early and often as possible. Bring the kids, bring the family. The weather's amazing. It's the happiest place on earth. It's better than Disneyland. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a new application called Customers. We're going to use Java 17. Um, Java 17 is the current long-term supported version of Java. It was up until like less than a week ago, the current supported version of Java as well, right? Every six months, they released a new version. They just released Java 18. It's amazing. I love Java 18. I love the, I mean, have you seen that they have an SPI now to override DNS resolution in your application? Oh, that's awesome. I cannot wait to see what I can do with that. Um, but yeah, so Java 17 is a good choice. It's smart. It's technically, it's technically sound. It's secure. It's more performant, more robust, more operations friendly. Uh, it's the right choice. It's Java 17 is the right thing to do in 2022, right? It, it is an amazing piece of technology for which I am endlessly grateful. And also GraalVM now, you know, works with Java 17. And also, also just, just in the last week, did you see that they released a dev 
build of GraalVM for Apple's M1 architecture. So I'm using an M1 Macintosh, Apple, Apple uh, Mac, but Pro. And um, up until now, if I wanted to show you native images, I had to have a separate shell open and then SSH, SSH into that machine while I was doing my demo. And I'd do the, I'd do the, uh, the, the GraalVM native image on that machine. I don't have to anymore. Watch, this is gonna be the first presentation. Fingers crossed that it'll go okay. I'm gonna do a GraalVM native image here on the Mac. Uh, okay, so anyway, we've got our application. Our application, we need a few things. We need uh, a SQL database because why not? Uh, we need R2DBC. R2DBC is a reactive relational database connectivity abstraction. Uh, we need Actuator, which is which supports operations. We need the reactive web support. Uh, Lumbuck, I don't know if we need Lumbuck. Let's see if we can get by without Lumbuck. Uh, we need H2, reactive web, Actuator. <sighs> I think that's it. Oh no, we need one more thing, Spring Native, okay? Spring Native uh, gives us support for building GraalVM native images, okay? We'll hit generate and that'll give us a zip file which we're gonna open up in our IDE. So here we are, open that. Some coffee. All righty. Customers application. It's gonna. It's loading dependencies. It's thinking very. Oh, look at that. Spring Boot two point six five. I guess that just came out. When did that come out? Let's see. Do do do. Three point oh m two. Two point seven oh m three. Wait, what is this? Spring Boot 3.0. Okay. Two, oh, there you go, 265. So it came out yesterday. Like, uh, okay, that explains why we have to wait. Uh, okay, well, this is our life now. Okay, there we go, so it's up and running. Good, so we can see it's just a stock standard uh, Spring Boot build. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna build an application that uses reactive programming to talk to the database. So we've got H2, it's running in memory on my local machine. We're gonna use R2DBC, which is, as I said, a way to do reactive database access. Um, reactive programming gives us three big benefits. One is ease of uh, composition, two is robustness, and three is uh, resource efficiency. That is to say, we make good use of our threads. And so I like re reactive programming, um, you know, and uh, it makes sense. If you're trying to build applications at scale, you want reactive programming today, okay? So we're gonna build a spring data R2DBC repository uh, that takes advantage of uh, the, the, the H2 database there. It's gonna do SQL data access. Um, I need to have SQL, right? So I'll go here and I'll say, I'm gonna create a little file here called schema.sql. I'm gonna create a table called customer ID serial primary key name var car 255 not null, all right? Good stuff, so there's that. and. Uh, what I want to do is I want to have a simple, I want to have some sample data in there as well. So I'll say data to SQL and I'll say insert into customer uh, name values. Uh, and I've got my say Stefan, I've got uh, uh, who else? Let's name some people on the spring team. Okay. Who else do we have? Uh, the good Dr. Sire, of course. We've got uh, Jurgen, magnificent. We've got Stefan. Beg your pardon. Okay, so we've got some names there. That's a seven. Oh, and me, I forgot about myself. A little, yours truly. So that'll be Josh. Let's go ahead and run this application. We're, we're gonna build an application that actually uh, enumerates the data when it starts up. So we'll just say application winner, return args, and we're gonna just use the repository dot find all dot subscribe. Okay, just printing out the results. Just to see that it works. And you know what? I also want a um, uh, an HTTP controller, okay? I'll build an HTTP endpoint for our data. So at controller, uh, here we are, class customer rest controller, private final customer repository. And um, come on, good. So there's this, and I'm gonna create an endpoint here, customers, publisher of customer gets Turn this dot customer repository find all et voila. Let's go ahead and restart this and see what it gives us. Okay, so there you go. We can see the names 
uh, on the console. It has worked. There's our data, all of it. Hooray. Of course it worked. It was a demo. What were you expecting? It was always going to work. It was always going to work because that's not the important part, right? Anybody can build a REST endpoint and write some data to the database these days. That's not a big deal. Getting your software to production, on the other hand, that's much more interesting. So the first thing that I care about when I want to get my software into production is observability. That is to say, can my application articulate its own state? Can it make itself understood so that the rest of the organization isn't uh, in the dark about what the service and the system is doing? One way to support that is to use the Spring Boot Actuator module, which brings in a number of managed HTTP endpoints that give you information about the application itself. So in order for that to work, though, I want to enable a few uh, endpoints here. I'm going to enable all the web endpoints. I'm going to enable uh, Kubernetes. Uh, probes. I'm going to uh, show the health details. And, um, you know, not all of these are going to make sense for all your apps. In fact, some of them don't make sense uh, unless you're doing a demo as I'm doing. So for example, you wouldn't want to do this. This is going to expose all of your endpoints, okay? All of your uh, actuator endpoints. Okay, let's go ahead and start this and see what that gives us. Okay, so we go here, localhost. Uh, and by the way, you know what I just realized before we go on too far down the line? Uh, I should also reset the database. So schema, so uh, delete from customer. There we go. Oh, no, it's it's embedded. It's not going to reset. Good. Okay, yeah. So uh, we've got now the browser, localhost actuator forward slash. And that gives us a number of managed HTTP endpoints. These endpoints give us information about the state of the application itself, the health of the application itself. So for example, the beans endpoint tells me all the different objects in the Spring application context and how they relate to each other, their dependencies, their types, etc. The caches endpoint shows me all the cache manager implementations. Health gives me information about all the subsystems in the application that if they were to fail, would mean the service is down, okay? So I have a file system, I have liveness and readiness probes for Kubernetes. We'll come back to that in just a second. I have uh, my connection factory for my database, my R2DBC connection, uh, et cetera, okay? Uh, so we'll come back to health in a second, but that's a very important one. It, it returns HTTP 200 if everything is okay, or it returns 500 if something is wrong. I've got the uh, info endpoint, which is where you put information about the application itself, the health of the application, into in, interesting information that you can use to identify the application. So I can say info dot um, env enabled equals true, and I can say info dot uh, message equals hello voxed Bucharest, right? Uh, 2022, very good. So if I restart that, I think it's not, uh, it's probably Vox, is it Vox days? Oh, it's been so long since I had to remember that. Let me just, I'm assuming it's one of those two. Uh, here we go. There we go, good. So Vox days, Bluegrass, okay. So I got a message there. You can also put information about the build of your application. So I wanna build my, let's, you know, it's imagine it's a continuous delivery pipeline and I am gonna do a git commit, git commit ID plugin, okay. Go back to the pond.xml and go down to the plugins. And voila. So I've got this plugin here. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to just, I'm going to uh, build the application after I've turned it into a Git repository. So git init, git add, git status, git add mvn, git add that git ignore, git commit uh, yolo. Okay, so now Maven skip tests clean package because who's got time for tests when there's a demo to be done? Uh, recompiling. Okay, so what that's going to do is it's going to create a file called git.properties um, in the target directory. I guess it hasn't been indexed yet, IntelliJ. What's that about? Uh, so git.properties. It's a bunch of things that tell me information about the, the commit that triggered the build. So I do, I make some changes. I commit terrible, terrible code into my branch. I hit git push, the continuous integration server rebuilds the jar, uh, and then it, it sees that this is a git clone of a particular revision of the branch, and it packages all this information in the jar as this file called git.properties. Well, Spring Boot knows about that file. So when you run this endpoint, you can go, oh, okay, this is this code is running this branch, this version from this timestamp, and you can you can expand all this information. But basically, if you have a lot of services, this helps you to identify 
the service. What is running where, okay? Uh, conditions, shows me all the different conditions that Spring Boot evaluates when it starts up um, to, to you know, result in the application that you see before you. ENV shows you the different environment variables and all their uh, values. Secrets and passwords, those are all masked off, so you can't see those. We have log loggers, which are great if you wanna see the log levels and you can, you can send a post to this endpoint to change the log levels for certain loggers. That way you can do, and you know, I wanna set this thing to be debug for debugging, whatever. Um, heap dump gives you a heap dump, thread dump, a thread dump. Metrics gives you keys and values related to this state of your application. And it's in turn powered by Micrometer, right? Micrometer is an application metrics facade that supports App Optics, Azure Monitor, Netflix Atlas, CloudWatch, Datadog, Dynatrace, Elastic, Ganglia, Graphite, Humio, InfluxDB, JMX, KairosDB, New Relic, Prometheus, Google Cloud Stackdriver, StatsD, and of course, VMware's own Wavefront, right? So very, very powerful abstraction. Lots of integration all throughout the industry, not just in, it's not, it doesn't require Spring, right? It's a separate project from Spring. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we've got uh, metrics and mappings. Mappings gives me all the different HTTP endpoints uh, and, uh, you know, the predicates that provide them and, and all that. Okay, so let's go back to that health endpoint, yeah? Um, that health endpoint, like I said, it gives you information about the current application and its health. So I can actually contribute my own custom health indicator. I can say health indicator, return new health indicator. And I can, let's see here, health dot status, I heart production dot build, we start. And of course this could and should be a Lambda. Okay, so there we go. There's my custom health indicator, no big deal. I can also, I also have these two different probes. So this health indicator is great. It gives you a, you know, a, a Boolean. Is the service alive? Is it healthy? Yes or no, true or false, 200 or 500, right? <coughs> but um, if you want to uh, deploy this on Kubernetes, Kubernetes has two different health checkpoint endpoint, uh, you know, endpoint uh, concepts. One is called a liveness probe. The liveness probe tells you whether the service is still alive, whether it's re ready to respond, uh, whether it's able to continue responding to traffic. The other one is the readiness probe, which tells the platform whether the service is ready to be put into production. The liveness probe uh, is kind of like what the Spring Boot Actuator Health Endpoint does, right? The readiness probe is different. It's, it's what's checked in the beginning of the application before it is put into service. Now, both of these have to be provided. And so Spring Boot provides two different probes, two different endpoints, one called liveness and the other one called readiness, right? And you can change the behavior of those endpoints. So let's suppose I create a controller class uh, actuator, or let's just say health controller, yeah. And I'm gonna inject a reference to the current application context, okay? And uh, we'll say, uh, this is not restful, okay? It's just an HTTP endpoint, but I uh, just wanna show you this, so down. So now let's say that somebody invokes this endpoint. I want them to be able to change the, um, the, the liveness probe, right? So I have to pass in a liveness state broken, for example. Okay, and then I'll just return mono.empty. Let's try that. So this is an HTTP endpoint. Uh, and it's going to send an event to the other components in the Spring application context saying, hey, something is wrong. Please say to the world, advertise to the world that we're down. The service is not working. Okay. So you go here, you say, okay, um, uh, well, actually here, it still says uh, liveness, still says up, right? So now curl, HTTP, localhost, 8080, uh, forward slash down. Yeah. Um, is that not right? Oh. You know what it is? It's this thing, it's caching the build. It didn't recompile that. I always have this issue and I never remember to reset that. It's because I did the Maven clean package, you know? Okay, so this is up and down. And what's wrong with it now? Could not resolve a V, oh, okay. It's because it's a response body. It thinks it's doing a Spring MVC view resolver as opposed to HTTP restful-ish kind of thing. Okay, so. Up, 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 down, down, right? So you can see I'm able to use that mechanism to asynchronously sort of in a decoupled way, 
tell the application to, to register itself as being down. Well, what happens when I do that? Well, the service is now, it's down, right? The service is not available for consumption. Um, so what is, what is, what's gonna happen? Well, the, the platform is going to see that it's down and it's going to take the service out of the rotation. It's gonna take it out of uh, deployment, right? It's gonna take that pod in Kubernetes, the smallest deployment unit is something called a pod. It's not a container. You can have zero or you can have one or N pods, uh, sorry, containers per pod. And the Kubernetes deals with pods at the lowest level. Um, so uh, when, the, when Kubernetes sees this, it's gonna say, okay, the service is sick. I'll destroy this container, this, this pod, and I'll create a new instance of it, right? To try and, uh, to try and keep the service up. Uh, well, okay, what happens to the in-flight transactions that you've got? So we wanna make sure that our application degrades gracefully, right? So we want to use graceful shutdown, right? By default, by default, it uses immediate shutdown. So when you register as sick, when your service is sick and it's not working, Kubernetes immediately destroys the, the pod. Uh, and if you have any in-flight transactions, all of that just gets dropped on the floor. It's not great, right? You can do, you, you don't want to do that. So we have a different mode here called graceful shutdown. Here, Kubernetes will look at the, uh, in, you know, the, uh, sorry, Spring Boot will look at the incoming requests. It'll stop accepting new ones. It'll allow any in-flight transactions to finish up to a certain period. So you can you can have a period, uh, uh, let's say, of 30 seconds. Now, you have to configure this in Kubernetes as well. This number has to match in Kubernetes and in your, your Spring Boot config. Um, but basically, now, if, if there is something going on, if you have a long-running request that's still not finished yet, it'll, you'll have up to 30 seconds to finish it before uh, the, 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 content, the container orchestrator shuts everything down. And Spring Boot, for its part, will stop any incoming requests, right? So this is great because it gives you a way to, uh, to you know, shut down any work and clean up gracefully, okay? Now, I've got a bunch of configuration in here. Uh, and a lot of this is like Kubernetes specific, isn't it, right? This is like some of this stuff is just general purpose, but some of it's very specific. So. What I want to do is I'm going to change my configuration um, to reflect the fact that I've got a Kubernetes application. And so in Spring Boot, you can do this dash uh, triple hash syntax. And that means that this set of configuration is separate from this, or it might be in addition to. And you can actually have everything after that dash triple hash. You can have that, uh, sorry, hash double, triple ha dash. Uh, you can have everything after that be contingent or conditional on a con, uh, an activation um, uh, requirement. So I can say I want to activate only when I'm in Kubernetes, right? So let's say I'm in Kubernetes, I'll make the port 8010. Otherwise for everything, you know, by default, it'll be 8080. So if I run it right now, it'll think it's running on port 8080, okay? Okay, let's see, where's my application? There we go, running on port 8080. Now I can make this application think it's running in Kubernetes for my local testing by using this spring main cloud platform equals Kubernetes property. Uh, and here you can just specify that, right? So modify options. Where is the program arguments? There we go. Good. Apply, okay. So now we should see it start up on port 8010, not 8080. Uh, yeah, there we go. Starting on port 8010. So that's a conditional on the, if it's, if it thinks it's running in Kubernetes, it'll do that. So this is great. And I can actually, you know, now if I know I'm in Kubernetes, well, I don't want all my configuration to live inside my jar, do I, right? This is a, a big part of the 12 factor style manifesto. The 12 factor manifesto, uh, 12 factor.net. 12 factor manifesto is a set of principles created by the good people over at Heroku. This is a 12 year old or 13 year old uh, thing from many years ago. And uh, it's just good ideas, good principles for building software intended for production in a cloud, in modern day cloud technology. And one of the cool things that they talk about is this idea of configuration. Uh, and specifically, if you have configuration that is unique to a particular environment, that configuration should live in the environment, not in the jar, right? You should not have to recompile your application for each uh, environment. You should have one set of configuration, sorry, one application and multiple sets of configuration and you can layer them, you can ca cascade the configuration. So Spring Boot makes this very easy. 
uh, you can actually have your in, you can actually have environment variables. For example, I can do uh, you know let's say I wanted to do an environment variable version of this, right? I could do if I if I created this, if I put that in my environment, and then and then I started the Java process. That uh, this declaration, if it said eighty eighty one, that declaration would override either this one or this one, right? Because it has precedent. Uh, I can also create a file in the same directory. I can do all sorts of things. But another interesting option is I can have my configuration in a config map in Kubernetes. If it's in a config map, Kubernetes will load the configuration uh, in one of two different ways. One is you can use the config map to create an environment, uh, create environment variables. So the keys in the config, it's a map, right? So the keys in the config map become environment variable names. Uh, and then the values become the values of those environment variables. That's one option. The other, and that works. I mean, obviously you just saw, if you just do server underscore port, that, that works. The other option is to use um, a config tree. So Kubernetes has this concept of a, of a, of a directory full of configuration files. The, the files um, have as their contents, the values of the entries in the config map. And it has as the names, uh, you know, the names of the files are the keys in the config map, which is, it's a very confusing thing, but let's just, let's just see what I mean. So you can tell Spring, hey, I want to import some config from any, you know, there's a, it's a, it's a pluggable SPI. So you can, re, you can resolve configuration from lots of different places. One of the, one, one that's very popular is for Kubernetes, it's called a config tree. And so here, I'm gonna say I wanna load configuration from this directory called config on my desktop, right? So config tree, forward slash desktop, forward slash config. And here, I'm gonna create a directory structure that looks like the directory that you would get if you used a config map as configuration, okay? So cd config, and I'll say touch, uh, I'll say uh, echo 9191 to server.port, okay? So server.port, is equal to 9191. I'm telling Spring Boot to load this configuration, right? It's gonna be, it's only gonna load this configuration if it's running in Kubernetes though, right? So let's see what that looks like. So I specified 8010, but then I imported some configuration and the imported configuration, oh, I forgot to specify Kubernetes here again. Uh, Program arguments, thank you. Nope. Uh, spring dot main dot cloud platform equals Kubernetes, I think. Okay. Um, Oh, right, it has to be spring property placeholder resolution. Okay, so there you go, it says 9191. So it's loading the configuration, the Kubernetes config tree, it's loading that when it thinks it's running inside of Kubernetes, which is great, right? So you've got the ability to create config files that have different branches of configuration that behave, you know, that, that, that adapt to the environment in which the application is running. Uh, and of course you can do this in your Java code as well. I could, for example, have this uh, health controller for Kubernetes probes, right? I have this silly thing here. I could um, have a conditional on cloud platform, cloud platform equals Kubernetes, right? And so in this case, the spring bean will not exist. It doesn't exist unless you're running inside of a Kubernetes context, right? You can do that up here as well. You know, same idea, conditional on cloud, conditional on cloud platform, uh, cloud platform dot, Kubernetes. Okay, there you go. So, lots of good stuff there. Um, this is very important because in, you know Kubernetes. You want your application to behave basically the same across multiple environments, but if it's going to be specific to Kubernetes, you want to make that very clear. You want to make that explicit. Okay, so we've got our application. I think we're ready to go to production. Almost ready. Okay, right? because what I want to do now is I want to take this application and turn it into uh, a native image, right? GraalVM native image. Now, GraalVM is an ahead of time compiler. It's a, it was a, originally an open JDK distribution that has a replacement just in time compiler to replace hotspot. 
Hotspot is awesome, but it's old and it's it's become kind of spaghetti code. So they wanted to rewrite it with mostly Java code, make it cleaner to operationalize and so on, uh, and to update. Sorry, my heater just went on. So uh, they wanted to use um, they wanted to replace that just in time compiler, and you can you can use it just like that. You can just replace the just in time compiler. It's faster. It's better. It's fine, right? That's nice. But that's not what most people are talking about when they talk about GraalVM. You see, GraalVM also has this thing called an AOT compiler. It does AOT or ahead of time compilation. <coughs> uh, when you do just in time compilation, you adaptively take the code that you've written uh, and turn certain parts of it into native architecture and operating, sy operating system specific binaries. Well, why not just turn the whole application into native binaries, right? Well, the reason is because the compiler doesn't have enough information to do that in a deterministic way because the runtime that Java promises you is very dynamic. Actually, it's really dynamic, much more dynamic than you can get without extra information uh, in a native context, right? You have to rebuild that runtime uh, in the native code otherwise. Java can, you know, Java may feel like an old stodgy uh, systems programming language, but it is anything but, right? It has a lot more in common with JavaScript and Ruby and Python and so on than it does with C and, and, and COBOL and the like, right? It's actually a very dynamic language. You can, in Java, after the application has started, you can take a Java string, which has as its contents the definition of a class, you know, class cat, curly bracket, curly bracket, whatever. You can take that string, <laughs> compile it into a dot class file, write it to the file system, load the dot class file into the class loader, create an instance of the class file using reflection, uh, invoke methods on the class. You can create a Java proxy using the proxy invocation handler API uh, of that type if it's an interface. Uh, and you can serialize that instance all entirely after the application is started. So not before, not after, not during compilation, all at runtime, right? Uh, and that's amazing, right? <laughs> You could, you know, the the it's basically eval. I'm, I don't know if you, you've ever used a uh, scripting language, right? But they all, they often have a method called e eval, e v a l, or evaluate, uh, and it's pretty crazy. You can actually do that kind of thing on Java, right? Uh, and uh, the result is all these things that you're doing are not obvious to the compiler at compile time. It doesn't know that you're going to do these things, and so if you have something like Gravium's uh, AOT compiler. What the GraalVM AOT compiler does is it looks at the code at compile time and it looks at what code your code is using. So if your code is calling this method in this class over here, it can say, oh, your code is calling that code. Therefore, that code is reachable, right? Reachability in the GraalVM context refers to how, you know, the, the graph of invocations that your code is doing uh, and is creating by, by virtue of the... Uh, the uh, things it exercises, right? But all that stuff I just described, all that stuff where you're doing, where you're loading types from jars, when you're doing reflection, proxies, serialization, uh, all that stuff is not reachable. It doesn't know about that, right? Like it's, it's possible to do all of that without ever having a concrete type. It's just Java Lang object the entire way um, and method handles and, and things like that. So, so uh, we have a bit of a problem, right? We want Java, we love Java, Java is dynamic. It's powerful. It's flexible. Uh, it, you know, it's it's got a lot of similarities with you know really really dynamic languages like like Lisp. Uh, but we also want native images. We want to be able to have code that works kind of like C and and and, and uh, Rust and the like. So, how can we do that? Well, we just give the compiler extra information because otherwise the compiler is going to throw away those types. The Gravium compiler does an analysis of your code. It looks for all the things that are reachable. It keeps those and it throws away everything else, which makes me sad here in my heart and in my mind because I like those types. I worked hard on them and it makes me sad when Gravium just throws them away. So you can keep those types by using, uh, by, by feeding in configuration into the Gravium compiler. Uh, there are command line switches and there's also some JSON configuration uh, formats that you can use. The problem with this is that uh, they're very stringy, right? And they're also not very dynamic. So if you're building a programming model, if you have a, a component model like what Spring has or what most frameworks have, then there's no way for you to describe in that configuration 
uh, that any type of whatever with an annotation or with an interface or whatever should be considered uh, reachable, right? So you have to provide, we, what we need is some way to more, be more programmatic. Well, this is where Spring Native comes in. Spring Native is a project that we've been working on since 2019. Spring Native uh, provides a way to provide that configuration. It's a build time tool chain, right? Uh, and it feeds in the configuration uh, to the Gravium compiler. And, uh, and that configuration then helps GraalVM know what your application is gonna do. So if you're building a, a, a typical uh, Java application today, there's lots of places where GraalVM needs to know what you're doing. Uh, and so this, this project, the goal of this project is to make that easier. And there's a lot of things that are really interesting. that are really, you know, really new, new interesting possibilities now in that world. So let's go ahead and kick off a uh, GraalVM native image build here. Uh, where am I? Which folder? Drive live customers. CD drive live customers. Maven. I'm going to do minus p native. That's a Maven profile. I'm going to do skip tests because otherwise it'll compile the tests and run them as native code. Uh, and then I'll do Maven clean package. So it's going to that'll take you know a minute and a half minute. It doesn't. It's not very uh, fast, right? Uh, this is one place where Go programmers have a really nice situation. They can write code and they compiles very quickly into native code. But for us, we have to kind of just wait. Uh, and that's okay. I can t during that time. Let's just talk about some of the opportunities here. Spring Native is a programming model, um, and it sits outside of Spring. It's not actually, you know, it's not in Spring Framework itself. It's not in Spring Boot. What we were trying to do in the last three years was to validate an approach that would allow us to take existing applications and get them to work in a Spring in a, in a native GraalVM context. And I think for the most part, we have succeeded. If you have a, an application using Spring Boot. Uh, you know, 2X and uh, Spring Framework 5X, then you probably can upgrade pretty easily and start using this. And in fact, the goal here is to support all sorts of different workloads. So if you have applications written in Spring Framework 1, for example, uh, then you can take that code, upgrade it to the latest jars, and then use Spring Native to turn that into a native image. We want to support the large ecosystem of Spring releases and make that just an opportunity for everybody, right? By the way, Yesterday, the 24th of March, uh, was the 18th birthday of Spring Framework 1.0, which I think is really cool. So, you know, happy birthday. Um, so the goal here is to take all those applications and make it easier for you to turn them into native images. But what we really want going forward is to actually take all that work, that research that we've done in Spring Native, uh, and to put it in Spring Framework itself. So Spring Native works. It works well. Uh, but it's not officially part of Spring Framework. We haven't changed Spring Framework uh, that much. You know, there's no fundamental changes. There's nothing like that. It's just small things here and there that don't break any compatibility, even implementation compatibility, right? Um, and we've, we've done that, but now we have a unique opportunity. You see, later this year, my friends, we're going to release Spring Framework 6 and Spring Boot 3. These are new generations. And by the way, for Spring Framework 6, uh, we are going to assume a Jakarta EE baseline of, I think it's 10, and we're going to assume a Java 17 baseline. I know that may seem a little aggressive because some people are still clutching on to Java 8. Why? Uh, but think about the timelines, right? When did Spring Framework 5 came out? It came out in September of 2017. That's almost five years ago, four years and some change, right? By the time Spring Framework 6 comes out later this year, much later this year, um, it'll already be more than five years. So Java Spring Framework 5 had a baseline of Java 8, right? Java 8. Uh, and here we are five years later and we're upgrading to Java 17. Well, now Java is coming out every six months. So imagine where we'll be in five years. That's 10 more releases. Let's say that Java 19 will be out by the time Spring Framework uh, 6 comes out, right? Java, Java 18 just came out last week or in the last week. Um, and then, so we add six months, that'll be Java 19. Here comes Spring Framework 6. And then you assume five more years, that's Java 29, maybe even Java 30, right? That's a long lifetime for your uh, supported baseline version. So we are hoping people will make the jump to Java 17. You should really do it. It's good stuff. It's better in every way. It's faster, more robust, more secure uh, than Java 8 in every way. It's also, if you judge purely by the number it's more than twice as good as Java 8, okay? So I totally recommend it. Um, okay, so there's my application. It took a minute and 13 seconds to compile. 
let's run this now. So I've got this application here. Do I want to allow it? Yes, I do. Thank you. So that took 89 milliseconds, right? And that's because, let me see. Let's control C it. There we go. 74 milliseconds. I didn't have to wait for the prompt. So if I do P grep uh, customers, that gives me a PID. Let's get the resident memory footprint. RSS by PID. Okay. So it's taking about 100 megs of RAM, right? That's awesome. That means that this application, which contains an embedded database, an embedded web server, the actuator, uh, you know, full Spring Data RTBC integration and all that other stuff, all of that taken together is still just 100 megs compared to your typical Java application, which, you know, what, 500 megs at least, right? I mean, these days. Uh, so this is 5x uh, more efficient, right? It starts up in almost no time at all, 74 milliseconds, a blink of an eye. Um, this is a good deal, right? Uh, this is a very good deal because now I can take my existing applications, turn them into native images, and I can reduce my data center spend, right? That's awesome. Now, remember, when you build Java applications using GraalVM, the runtime, the garbage collector is not as efficient as on the JRE yet. I'm sure it'll get better. It doesn't matter though, because today I can deploy two instances. So let's do a hypothetical. I'm, I'm not sure if this is real, but just let's just suppose, okay? Let's suppose that my Java application on the JRE can handle whatever, 70,000 requests, no, 50,000 requests. There you go, just call it 50. Who cares? Simple math, okay? It's 50,000 requests per second. Let's say that my GraalVM native image can only handle 40,000 requests per second, but it takes up one fifth of the footprint, at least one fifth of the memory footprint and the resources of the JRE application. So now I can deploy two of those native applications in my Kubernetes cluster, and I'm still, I'm st I'm still 60% cheaper than the situation I had before, right? And, I, and now I've got more uh, availability. I've got more uh, ability to handle requests per second. I can now do uh, 80,000 requests per second for 60% less price. This is a big deal, my friends. I'm, a, I'm super excited about this. And again, we are just starting to do this process, right? We're starting, we've got it working. It's now technically sound, but now we can integrate it into Spring Framework 6 and Spring Boot 3, uh, and we can optimize. And I can't wait to see those results. Uh, the way you you can actually write Spring Native configuration, that configuration can live in your application. Uh, and it it's it, it can be added to your application just like a jar. You just add it to the class path and Spring Boot will automatically pick it up in the future. Spring Native right now picks it up, right? So if you add it to the class path, Spring Native automatically uh, activates it and it contributes it to the build, which means that now if you're using a third party library, like for example, MyBetis and Spring and Spring Boot, you can just automatically turn it into native, right? Uh, if you're using you know, any library that has integration for this. So one thing I've been really excited about is writing Kubernetes controllers. You can easily use the Fabricate uh, or the official uh, Kubernetes IO uh, Java client. You can use those Java clients. I have written Spring Native hints. It's kind of like auto configuration. So Spring, uh, wait, Kubernetes Native Java, github.com. I've got this GitHub organization here. And I've got hints that I've written. Here's some controllers, Fabricate controller and the Kubernetes Java client controller. Here's the Fabricate Spring Native hints and the Kubernetes IO uh, Java Spring Native hints, right? These hints, when they're on the class path, automatically compile these libraries. So now you can write controllers and operators and custom resource definitions for Kubernetes using these types, right? There's some really, really interesting opportunities here, uh, my friends. The, um, the, <laughs> the future is bright and of course, I've been spending a lot of time working with all these different ecosystem projects uh, and, and you know community projects to sort of make it easier to work with uh, native. So uh, my betas, I mentioned that, jhipster, okta, uh, the uh, job schedule um, uh, you know, just, just a countless number of projects. I can't even remember all of them now. Uh, so the list is growing and it'll get even bigger once all the stuff lands in Spring Boot. Right now, Spring Native is a research bed. It's a test bed for us to prove out some ideas. Uh, and so things are changing, it's a little volatile. And by the time it gets into Spring Framework 6 later this year, um, it'll, it'll obviously stabilize quite a bit. It'll be a lot more mature. And then we can really focus on building out the ecosystem even further. But right now, a huge number of projects already work out of the box. Things like Spring Batch and Spring Integration, Spring Data. You saw me use a bunch of these modules already. 
uh, you know, just some amazing opportunities here, my friends. I am very curious about your feedback. Now, the next thing we want to do uh, when we're in our way to, to production is to build a Docker image. Now, the one thing that doesn't quite work here from Java is the build pack support. I, I'm not sure. I haven't tried it on the M1 recently, but when I tried it last time, it doesn't work great, but it does work from, from your CI environment, certainly. So what build packs are, is they're a way to take an application artifact and turn it into a container. Uh, it's a Cognitive Computing Foundation specification. It was built by the folks at Cloud Foundry and the folks at Heroku, you know, from uh, working for years and years together on something called build packs. And um, uh, this technology, you know, it, the core idea is very simple. Why should we reinvent the recipe for containerizing our applications? Since we do it so often, and there are only so many different ways to run a Java application. How many different technologies do we need to do Java minus jar, right? Why do we all rewrite that Docker file? It's, it's a nightmare. No, 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 don't do it, right? Be the change you wanna see in the world. Use uh, uh, something like build packs, which has a recipe. So you give it a dot jar and it gives you a container that has the jar and the JRE and all that stuff. If you're using Spring Native, it'll give you a native application, a native Linux image that it builds in the Linux container that runs in that Linux container. So you can actually build a Docker image using build packs that uses Spring Native to build a Linux native image. So you're ready to go. You, you can then Docker tag and Docker push that to your production environment. Spring Boot takes that a step further. We actually have support in the Maven plugin, but like I say, I don't think it'll work on my machine, the M1, but it will work on your CI environment, for example. So Maven Spring Boot, build image, right? That'll actually use build packs behind the scenes in this, you know, in case you don't want to download the, the pack CLI and so on. So this gives you a really efficient way to get software into production. Um, production these days, like I say, is Kubernetes. So the idea that you can use Spring and you can use uh, GraalVM to build operators, to build controllers, the idea that you can write applications that are containerized and ready to go to production, the idea that you can build really efficient low footprint uh, applications that are deployable in that context. Uh, all of that is just amazing. You know, the, the future is bright. I can't wait to see what people do. Uh, I wanna thank you for your time. I hope you got something out of it. I'm happy to answer questions as always. Uh, and I hope you're all safe, happy and healthy. Thank you very much, uh, Josh. Uh, I uh, pasted a question from, uh, from the rocket in the, in the chat. Uh, can you see it in the private chat? Mm. Uh, let's see. Well, a lot of, lot of stuff going on here. Um, private chat. Uh, in the right, in the right of the window, we can, uh, we, we are speaking. Yeah, so I read yesterday that Java apps which use it JIT are still more efficient than Java native images. Is this true? Like I said, I last I checked, yeah, I mean, he said exactly the same thing I just said, which is, uh, yeah, in theory, the garbage collection is less, it's, it doesn't collect as many objects as the JRE, as, the, as Java does, as the regular JRE does. But again, you can compensate, you can scale horizontally and compensate. So it's a, it's a win-win either way, yeah. A question that has already been answered, I, I would say. But a good question, very good question. Okay. Um, thank you very much for, for your presentation, uh, Josh. Oh, thank uh, you. Um, people asked if uh, the, uh, the project will be published on Git. So I suppose uh, it will uh, be published on, on your GitHub. Uh, yeah, so there's a, a much bigger example. Let me see, repositories. Is it here? I have way too much stuff here. So uh, da -da -da. I'm looking at my um, GitHub. Sorry, you can't see my screen. I'm trying to figure out where I put that stuff. I think it's just in Kubernetes native Java. If it's not there, I'll, I'll or check out Josh Long, github.com for slash Josh Long. But I think it's in Kubernetes native Java or Josh Long. Either but, way. Uh, usually you are very responsive on Twitter. So if they oh, yeah. have uh a question yeah. uh, they will get an answer back for you from you right yeah i do try my direct messages are open by the way my friends you can you know uh, don't feel shy 
<laughs> uh, okay, Josh, thank you very much for, for uh, taking the, the, the night time uh, and being with us. And I hope My pleasure. the next version of, uh, of Vox Days we'll see each other in person uh, and uh, we'll put all uh, this year, these two years behind us. Um, yeah. And here's hoping so, we all like, come on, DevOps. Let's go, DevOps. We, yeah, you saw yeah. there's you saw Java one, right? Like that. That's good news. I need more good news. Yeah. Let's make this yeah, happen. Yeah, yeah. I would I'm risk so... it. I would get on a plane to go to DevOps. I missed that amazing show. Yeah, yeah. Me too. So um, uh, see you, see you next edition. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.